and we are live hey everybody um if you are following us from the blog uh we're starting about a half hour early tonight figured no harm no foul because probably not too many people tuning in unless they uh catch us on facebook or something like that um welcome to publish like a motherfucker course 10 and this is what i'm calling the live action listener mailbag we are recording as i said about a half hour early so this is uh Tuesday, november 22nd 2022 at 6 30 p.m eastern standard time and the syllabus for this episode is in this very special episode we've got the script and don't worry, the kids still say that. We'll be joined by a longtime listener and up-and-coming author, P.R. Marsh, who will serve as a proxy for the audience and ask me all those questions and anxieties that worry away a hungry young artist's writing time. Um, so unlike a regular listening listener mailbag episode, we'll get to have a nice organic conversation, and you folks can join us too if you tune in live. So don't miss it. And uh, I'm getting a text... Sounds like somebody wants to tune in live here. But oh. if you are out there, um, go ahead and make your comments in the comments section. And so that'll look like this. I'll put a little test comment in here. Oh. And we can share that on the screen there. So if you don't have, um, you know... It, it, if you don't have a phobia about, you know, us responding to your comments, um, go ahead and let us know and we will talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, so that being said, let me introduce Mr. PR Marsh and I'm pointing the wrong way because everything's moved. And, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Pete? Yeah, sure. So I, I just go by PR Marsh is my author name, but my name is Pete, Peter Marsh. And, um, I'm glad that you said anxieties in your introduction because I definitely have a lot of author anxieties. I have yet to publish a book, but I've definitely been inspired by your YouTube videos. Um, and you actually gave me some advice one time. Uh, I I reached out to you and you were really awesome and we're like, hey, what's your phone number? And we talked for a little bit and you gave me some really helpful advice. And I've just been a fan since then. Um, I have two books that I'm working on that I'm planning to get out by uh 2023 but i'm kind of going at my own pace i'm brand spanking new to this and so um if people are interested in me based on this interview i also have two youtube channels which are also podcasts one is called the lasser cast where i review uh horror movies and tv shows with my friend danny and the other one is comic books transformed where i talk about comic book adaptations with my friend brian so that's me <laughs> very cool yeah. yeah, and um, I don't want to poison the well or anything, but you said uh, maybe I'll come on one. Is it the Lasser cast? Yeah, yeah, I, I okay. definitely want you on there. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um, I need to get out there more. And uh, yeah, the thing about published like a motherfucker, it's so um, not like not scheduled. It's, I, I think sometimes about doing it once a week, but I'm like, I feel like I would just run out of a lot of material. And then I get to the point where, you know, like this is only the second one I've done this year. Um, so, you know, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure I got to figure something out. What do you guys, did you guys do weekly for both of those or? We don't really have a set schedule. We actually post uh, a whole bunch of videos in a week, like, you know, three or four. Um, I usually try to have like one main video where it's me and Danny, but uh, every so often I interview horror writers too. So like I would interview you. And, um, you know, I've had uh, Joe Lanzell, Josh Mallerman. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah. I've Heavy had, hitters. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just actually interviewed Tom Holland, not Spider-Man, but Tom Holland who did uh, Child's Play. And oh. Fight Night. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, you know, we, we have a video like at least once per week, but there is like usually two or three per week. And it's just kind of based on what's out there. Very cool. Yeah. Oh, hey, we do have a comment. All right. Oh, boy. Kaylee Marie Edwards says, hey, guys. Hey, Kaylee. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Um, so good. So that seems to be working. Um, looks like we do have some kind of audience here. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to I don't want to lead too much. I certainly can lead. Yeah. Like I always I always say whenever I'm doing panels and that kind of thing, like I'm a writer, I could talk at you easily for an hour nonstop. But I, I am kind of interested in this. I want to hear what, you know, is weighing on your mind and, and what you're interested in hearing about. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. The audience so, too. Sure. So I, um, I'm in a writer's group and uh, everyone that's in my group is actually pretty established and has multiple published works. And I, I reached out to them and I said, hey, do you guys have any questions that I could ask Stephen to? Um, and so they gave me a few questions about publishing and just sort of uh, getting an agent and things like that. And then I had some questions for a guy like me, like just basically starting out. Um, I thought that the way that I could frame it is kind of like almost like a, um, you know, like a like a refresher for your publish like a motherfucker course, you know, because you've okay. kind of touched upon all these elements before. And I just thought it kind of be like you can kind of go back to some of the things that you've said in the past. And maybe some things have changed since you've done those videos, too. Yes. And that that's an interesting thing I want to I was thinking about very recently and when we were planning this. And I assume the first question is who? Who the hell is that? Is, is that the first question that your established friends asked? Oh, no, no, no. They totally knew who you were, man. A lot of oh. them are fans of hematophages, so. Oh, very cool. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. So uh, the first question, though, is from me. And so uh, you and I kind of reconnected via the Kingdom, which, like, is Brian Keen's, like, message boards that he kind of put up in, uh, you know, to kind of compensate for the lack of Twitter or the potential downfall yeah. of Twitter. And, um, you know, speaking of Brian Keen, he um, has kind of served as like a mentor for you and for like Wiley Young. Mm -hmm. And as a guy who's like, you know, just starting out like me, even though I'm 40 years old, um, I kind of wanted to know what is that like to get someone like that to be your mentor? And like, how does that go about? Because like, I feel like if you approach someone, like how do you approach someone and be like, hey, can you take me under your wing? Like, how does that work? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny thing that you ask that um, because it's it's the way that um, Brian explained it to me. He said, "When you first came on my ra you meaning me, when when you first came on my radar, um, I got good vibes from you, and I don't always get good vibes from people." Which now, ten years later, I'm like, "Oh, I get what he was talking about." There's a, there's a lot of climbers, there's a lot of shit birds, and that kind of thing. And actually, come to think of it, if you go back and you watch the Brian Keene episode of Published Like a Motherfucker, we talked about some of that. But he said to me something along the lines of, he's like, you may not even know it, but we are all tracking this. And we're all kind of paying attention to you. And um, we notice whether you're doing good things, you're doing bad things, whether basically you're worthy of mentorship, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And um, I think he probably officially or semi-officially started using that word maybe a year or two after i'd known him he's like yeah you don't you probably didn't you probably don't know this yet but you're my protege now and i was just like <laughs> okay um so it was very much like i did not go to him um he just kind of like you said took me under your wing um and it was very similar with wiley i know he's he's such a good you know kind-hearted kid and everything i say kid he's like you said, you know, I'm 40 and he's like 37 or something, but uh, he's got that boyish enthusiasm, you know, like you can tell he's not like faking it. Like he's really happy to be here and happy to be involved. And um, he said something, he said something similar. He was like, I saw that. And here's the other half of the equation, more or less. Um, and he's told me like, you have the chops and the same thing about Wiley. He's like, he's got skill. What he lacks is, you know, experience, maybe connections and that kind of thing. So I have found that sadly, you know, you come across some people in this and they'll be perfectly lovely people and they're welcome in the community and you're happy to have them and you're happy to see them at cons and everything. But God help them. They're just not very good writers and they're just not getting better. Yeah. Um, so I think you have to have that combination of things. I think you have to impress someone, have a good personality and impress someone and then be a good writer mm -hmm. um, to be essentially, I hate to put it this way, but essentially you're not, I'm not wasting my time mentoring you. Right. Um, and so that being said, I, yeah, I don't know if I'm in the position where I'm mentoring anybody in particular uh, or whether I'm even in the position that I should be. Uh -huh. But um, I try to, every time I meet someone, you know, like we just met someone, uh, oh God, it's going to kill me. I'm just going to, I'm just going to not use any names and pretend I didn't just forget the names. <laughs> um, 
but you know you meet young people at these events like we just did the Gulastic uh book festival in mechanicsburg pennsylvania this week mm -hmm. and you meet a young guy and you're like oh he's enthusiastic he's you know that's a good first step you shake hands you like somebody then at some point i'll check out his work um but anybody that comes to me and is like i need help with xyz i'll probably do like what i did with you pete if it's a complicated question and i'll be like give me a call I would much rather talk to you than have you abused by Tate Publishing or Publish America or some you know horrible person, horrible entity, I should say. Um, <laughs> and I'll be happy to do any of this information for anybody. Um, but that official kind of like, yeah, I'm going to give you opportunities. I'm going to help you out kind of thing. That's a much deeper um, relationship. And it's funny because I see it. I see a lot of people, you know, like Jeff Strand has taken a couple people under his wing and you see some of the more, you know, senior, um, they'll love that I said that, senior, aging, elderly, right. elder statesman. Elder statesman, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like Jeff, like Jeff Strand um, doing that. So I, I, it somewhat happens organically, but there's definitely A, be not a shit bird and B, be a good writer. I'd say those are the best things you can do. Do, does that answer the question? I feel like I was kind of rambling for a second. No, no. I think that actually answers it perfectly. Um, like the, the segue from that, Ben, is like what kind of constitutes a good writer, right? And like just one last thing to, about Brian Keene was that he um, – I'm one of his patrons, right? And he mm. posted this thing. I think he actually posted on Twitter too. But it was all about uh, this is not for you. I don't know. Did you see that post today? I did. I did okay. see that post. Yeah. And, and I feel like that is sort of like the line in the sand that he kind of draws there, which is like, there are the people that want to be writers and, or they want to say they're a writer. And then there are people that want to put in the time and it's like, they have to write because there's nothing else that they could do. Right. Yeah. And, um, I, I went through his little checklist and I got a little worried. I was like, Oh my God, am I, do I just want to be a writer versus, or want to say that I'm a writer? versus actually want to put in the time and the effort. And I was going through his checklist and um, he says that, you know, are you asking a veteran writer, what can you do for me? Then this right. is not for you, right? And um, if you're trying to like skip the process of like writing, revising and editing, and you're trying to jump the line, this is not for you, right? And um, he says, you know, if you want to be a writer, get better at it, get uh, better some more, put in the time and do the work. So. I find myself putting in the work at this point, but I have to say that the product that comes out, I am like not satisfied with. And uh, when I was younger, I wrote more and I was more prolific, um, but I, I kind of felt like, oh, this is good. I like, you know? And I think that as I've gotten older and I've read more, um, I'll look at my own writing and I'm like, oh man, this is really rough. And so I was gonna ask you, in your process of getting to where you are now, were you ever at a point where you were writing a lot, but you were not satisfied with what you're writing? Yes, and and I'm I'm also there still right now. <laughs> so the first thing I would tell you is I think that's a good thing. Um, and we've talked about I think you and I have talked about this before. Um, you're very neurotic as a writer. You're always worried. Uh, I, my worries tend more towards the, I think I pissed that person off and I think he's pissed off at me kind of thing when I see someone. So that's probably just social anxiety. But yeah. the the thing with never being satisfied with your work, I have to say, I think that's a good thing. Now, it can become a bad thing mm -hmm. um, because you do have to shit and not just sit on the pot at some point. Right. So... And I know there's that, who was it, Leonardo or Thomas Edison or somebody said, uh, you know, no work is ever finished. It's simply abandoned. So you do at some point have to abandon your work because you could literally sit and for 10 years tweak commas and still never really like be like, oh, this is perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a good thing. Uh, I think a lot of writers suffer from that. I think if you don't suffer from that, you're probably a piss poor writer and, and have a high opinion of yourself. And it's like you said, um, the comparison I wanted to make was when you're a kid, specifically when you're like a five-year-old kid or you're in kindergarten, 
and you paint one of those god awful finger paintings <laughs> of the sun and it's smiling and mommy and she's it should be 800 pounds in real life and the house is smaller than the you know dog or whatever mm. you're very pleased with that and you're like look i created something um and i think that that uh, we lose that joy as mm -hmm. we become teenagers and we realize I'm not really painting photorealistically or even surreally or I'm like, I'm not, if I have not developed as a painter, I'm like, Oh, well, this is crap now. I don't want to keep doing it. Um, I think it's similar to that. Mm -hmm. So it's like you said, you're, you're now aware you're reading more, you're looking behind the curtain. So like whenever I'm, you know, whenever I'm t uh, talking with my girlfriend and we're watching a show on TV, I'll say something like, oh, okay, so they didn't say the plan out loud. What does that mean, baby? And she'll be like, oh, that means the plan's going to go according to plan. I'll be like, oh, okay, this time they said the plan aloud. What does that mean, baby? And she'll be like, oh, that means the plan's not going to go according to plan. I'm like, yeah. So it's, it's like, uh, that's just an example where you've learned all the tips and tricks and everything that go into writing. So now you're identifying it in your own work. Right. And you're like, oh, I'm doing this ham fistedly. Right. Like, I wanted I wanted people to dislike the villain, so I had him literally kick a dog. And you're like, ah, uh, you know. Um, whereas, yeah, 10, 15, 20 years ago, I'm like, all right, my villain's in a black duster. And yeah, it's awesome, you know. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that that worry is a good thing to have. And I think that's what develops you as a writer. Mm -hmm. But the only caveat I would give to that is um, don't let it become debilitating. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, I will admit that that does become debilitating for me. Like it, yeah. it, it makes it like a real slog sometimes to sit down there. You know, like uh, you mentioned NaNoWriMo before we started recording. And NaNoWriMo was always helpful to me because it's like, okay, I have to make a certain word count and it doesn't matter if I'm writing shit. I just am sitting at this computer and I'm working on it. And I felt like that was the most helpful. I, I think the part that kind of fucks me up the most is um, there's certain beats that I want to nail in a story. I want to get to this one part. And then it's like, well, you have to set it up, right? And I find that the, the setup part, I'm like explaining everything needlessly. Right. It's like, oh, I'm going into all these details about how the guy picked up his glasses and he turned, you know, it's like I, I find that it's it becomes very tedious. And so, like, did that happen to you also, like where you over explained things at first? Um, yes, I know what you're talking about. And there is an art to learning how to elide that stuff. Um so because you have this problem right and this problem is that uh it's kind of the tolkien problem right so like if you just had were like frodo took a trip and then he threw the ring in the mountain and all you did was the ring in the mountain like you miss all that you know the the road was the point in a, in a book like that right um but then i also have this problem like you said like it, it's it's almost the opposite of that it's almost like a uh I don't know, like William Hope Hodgson in the Nightlands or something where it's like a diary of, and then I woke up and then I had ground oatmeal for breakfast. And I, bu 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 bu. I'm like, sometimes you have to have that stuff to give a sense of, of what's going on and to give a sense of immediacy and to be like, here's what he's experiencing auditorily and orally and, you know, orally and everything. Um, like you want everything to feel you know very real and immediate um but then you can just be wasting time talking about well how did he get from here to the store and you'll be like i could have just instead of writing that right put in a character br br uh, paragraph break and been like he walked into the store you know like i didn't need to he got into the car and he turned his keys and he did, 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 did. um so there's no like easy solution but what i will say is you can take those those problems and make opportunities out of them. Mm -hmm. So I wish I was I wish I was better at this. Like we were just talking about, I, oh. you always wish you were better at things. Right. But I feel like every word, every sentence, every paragraph, every scene in a book should have a purpose. Now, 
the purpose can be to drive the plot. Mm -hmm. The purpose can also be to illuminate the characters. Mm -hmm. So maybe you do want to have a scene where the character is just getting up and shaving in the morning because you want to say something about him through the brand of razor that he uses and the way that he does his face. Maybe he uses a straight razor. Maybe he uses an electric razor. You know, like that if if there's something in there that you want to express. So you can use those ligaments. Those like they're not it's not like good meat like in a turkey, you know, we're we're two days away from Thanksgiving. Right. It's not like the good meat in the turkey. It's like the ligament and the bone and crap. It needs to be there to hold right. the story together. So you can use those portions to illuminate the characters if you feel the need to keep them in there. So I feel like every every scene or sentence or anything in a story should either forward the plot or do something to illuminate the characters. And that's all I can really say about that. There's definitely stuff you can drop and there, you're definitely going to piss people off. Like with the hematophages, I was like, who needs to hear another explanation of how the super fancy science fiction ship gets from one end of the galaxy to the other. I'm like, who needs it? Who needs another explanation of that? Mm -hmm. And then I got a lot of people that were like, he never even explained how his hyperspace works. And I'm like, <laughs> really? Did you, I, I could have just said hyperspace, like in star Wars, you know, like, right. <laughs> was that really important? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the people that you're describing, I'm assuming that those are people that have read your books and they're writing reviews on Amazon and things like that, right? Uh, yeah, or read it, actually. Um, I've, I've, I've seen some, sometimes people talk about it on Reddit, Amazon, Goodreads, yeah, all over the place. But so, like, when you were working on hematophages, right, like, you had your beta readers, too, that you set up, like, what, what did that look like in the very, like, nascent stages of your career? like getting your books read by like people really close to you was it like a, a handful of people uh did you have sort of a system that you set up so that you could get like real valuable feedback from them um i in the very beginning i had a couple of people and i th i think i'll probably <laughs> hit on what i assume are are the two kinds of people that everybody runs into as beta readers um I asked a couple of people and there were different reasons. Like I had one friend who's a big civil war buff. So I'll probably ask him to read my civil war thing that I'm working on. And I had another friend that was like a uh, science journal editor. And I was like, Oh, well, he's an editor. Surely he can tell me, you know, where the commas and stuff are wrong. Um, and what I always found with beta readers is you get two kinds of beta readers, which is the one kind is like, uh, yeah, every word's perfect. Don't, don't change a thing. Right. And I'm like, well, that's useless. I may as well have not waited for your notes on that. Right. And then you have this other kind who's like, well, here's everything that I would have changed. You used the wrong adjective here. And the story is just not that good. And can you just go back to the drawing board and just do something about zombies again? And, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, that's also fairly useless. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I might be able to like dredge through your voluminous notes and pick out some valuable stuff, but it's almost as hard as having nothing right? as right. having too much. Um, so I've kind of, uh, like I said before, I I'll use beta readers in very rare instances now where I'll be like, like I said, my friend is a civil war buff or, uh, you know, if, if I have a specific reason, I'll use a beta reader, but I've kind of um, gotten past that point where, I like to use them. I, I, I know there's people like Keen, uh, you know, has been doing this 25 years or whatever. He still uses beta readers. If you can find them and they're good, that's great. But I think for me, like, I don't get a lot of value out of it anymore. Sure. Um, so I don't use them as much. Okay. So like, <laughs> Essentially, you just go through the edit yourself, and it's, you're just going by your own gut or your editor. Yeah. 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 Um, so I will, you know, and then there's all these little tips and tricks and things. Oh, it looks like Kaylee has a question. All right, we'll we'll grab that in a second. Yeah. Um, so there's there's all these little tips and tricks and things that they tell you that I 
also found useless. I, and, and again, this is one of those things where it's like, do what works for you. Sure. Um, but when I was reading this, I was like, how do you do the self edit and that kind of thing? There used to be this thing where they said, print it out. And when you have the full manuscript printed out, take right. a red pen and the red pen will be different from the black ink of the, of the thing. And then that'll help you. And you have to read it in a physical form. And I did that with Ghoul Archipelago, and I was like, this is the stupidest waste of fucking time I've ever... I was like, now I have to go back and take all this red pen shit and type it into the computer? Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> right. And then there was this thing where they said, read every word out loud. And I'm like... And I, and I did that. I forget what I did that for Brain Eater or something. And I was like, again... I get why they are saying that. What they're saying is look at it from a different angle. Yeah. And yes, you want to you want to make sure that it sounds right and i'm like but i can do that in my head mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. i'm like I, i'm past that point where i needed those like crutches uh, so i started I, I was like you know what i'm i'm just going to edit these things the way that i see fit so what i do now is i write the first draft mm -hmm. i go in and i am as i start to edit it i'll remember the big things that were issues, the big uh, developmental issues that I had. Sure. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, that guy's not supposed to be in Philadelphia at this point in time or whatever. Um, you know, so I'll like, I, I might have to massage some of that stuff or like leave it aside, but I'll basically go through and edit and make sure every sentence is, is good. And as I'm going through, go back and um, deal with some of the bigger developmental stuff. Sure. So like kind of like continuity issues and things like that. Yeah, yeah, and I'll I'll usually catch all that. Um, that's why I like to do the first draft before I do the edits. And I know some people like they'll some people will edit like what they did yesterday mm -hmm. before they start writing something new or whatever. I'm like I just like to get the whole first draft out because that's when I can identify the content. Yeah, the continuity errors where I'll be like oh shit i said something in hematophages that contradicts with skin wrapper or, or whatever right um i won't usually catch that and sometimes i'll be like even as i'm writing i'll be like oh this is an issue this shouldn't be happening but yeah. i have to push through and see where it goes in the next scene in the next scene right. and then be like okay maybe we can cut some of this stuff out that was the actual issue or or I guess the great thing about science fiction and horror is you just make something up. Right, a wizard, right, right. A wizard did it. <laughs> but, but you have to remember to say that a wizard did it. Right. Wait, so let me ask you this. About, like, the questions and stuff we might get, do you want me to read yep. the questions, like, kind of as a moderator, or...? Uh, I guess that's a good question. Um, with with yeah. StreamYard, you'll be able to highlight them, but I could, I could yeah. read them out loud if you want. Yeah, yeah, um, go ahead. So do you guys have any advice on how to tell the difference between your story just not being good enough to publish and when you're just being a perfectionist? I struggle with this. And that's from Kaylee Marie Edwards. Good question. Do you have an answer? Oh, uh, well, I mean, I personally do not have an answer for that. <laughs> I, I am constantly struggling with my own opinion. That, like, if you notice, a lot of the questions that I've asked have been about like other people's interpretation of your work or like how other mm -hmm. people view your work. And I think that um, that's like, there, I have questions lined up later about how much other people, how important they are to your own work. Um, but I, I bet you have a good answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's tricky and you'll spend your whole career doing it. Um, and there will definitely be times when you start a manuscript and you just put it aside and you're like, nope, that's not working. It's not going the way that I wanted it to. Um, I would say it's pretty easy to tell a difference between someone who's just being a hater when they dislike your manuscript and someone who has genuine problems. So um, as you're being published and the reviews start coming in, and this is why I think it's important to get a bunch of reviews, get a bunch of feedback um, on your last, I, sh I would say manuscript, but your last published work, I should say, um, before you proceed to your next one. Um, because if someone's just being a little whiny pants, 
they'll do like like the thing I was talking about where they're like, eh, I wanted to hear about the hyperspace, how that worked. And I'll be like, okay, your opinion is not really valid. But if there's five or ten people that have all said, like, uh, what are some other complaints I've had? Uh, of course, I'm, I'm only trying to think of, of the complaints that I've had. Um, but, you know, people will be like, oh, I felt that uh, Brain Eater Jones is the, uh, well, then I'm revealing the end of that story, but they'll be like, the big reveal at the end of Brain Eater Jones didn't make sense from a sociological perspective. I'm like, okay, that's fair. Like five or 10 people have said that. I'm like, okay, got it. Um, you know, I took a big swing. I got, I guess I made a big miss. Um so I think like ignore the stuff that's like a, ignore anything where they say like you're a bad person. First oh. of all, just throw that out. For, forget about that because you're probably not a bad person. And if if you are a bad person, sorry, I can't help you with that. That's way beyond oh. the scope of anything I can help you with in a podcast. Oh. Um, so first of all, Kaylee and everyone watching, throw out that stuff about if, if there's, and if they're saying that you are a bad person or, or in some ways, something like that, you can probably disregard that whole review. So that's one thing. Um, the stuff that's legitimate, you'll feel it in your bones. You'll be like, fuck, I fucked that up. I surely did fuck that up. And go back and write a sequel. And I, I remember, like I said before, oh, oh yeah, a wizard did it. I forgot to mention this. Yeah. Like there have definitely been things where I've been like, "Ooh, somebody really got me on that one," and I've if I ever do a sequel, I've got to you know mention what the issue was and and how it was fixed off screen or whatever. Um, but you'll you'll know it when when you get a a legitimate critique, you'll feel it and you'll be like, "Yeah," and if you get a critique and you're like not sure whether it's legitimate or not, eh, it's probably just a matter of opinion, so you know disregard it. Um. Mm -hmm. But looking at looking at your own stuff, keep pushing. I'd say send it to 20, 30, 40 people. Um, but that's me. I, I don't mind bashing my head against the wall. Uh, just because you've gotten 10 rejections from editors doesn't mean a whole hell of a lot, honestly. Um, I've gotten hundreds of rejections on every manuscript I've ever written. Uh, if that makes any of you feel any better. <laughs> I don't know if it does, uh -huh. but uh, yeah, well, the the time to the time to put it in your trunk is, and abandon it is uh, when just no one will pick it up. Okay. I don't know if that helps. But have you ever abandoned anything? Like no one oh, will yeah. pick it up to you? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to ask you, as you're in the process of writing a, a whole novel or a novella, right? Are you setting your work out to beta, uh, beta readers then, or are you wait until you're completely done and you feel like like you finish your first draft, you're you're on your revisions? Is oh, that when you yeah. share with people? No, I would never. I would never foist that upon someone unless I had completed the draft and done the author's edit. Okay. Um, yeah, I. I I know there's this thing where people want to do chapters and I think that's where you get caught up in the whole thing. Like what I was talking about before, where you're not seeing the forest for the trees. You're you, if, if you're so hung up on making chapter one, perfect, mm -hmm. you're gonna, you're gonna have a great chapter one and you're going to be so locked into that crap because now it's immutable and it's all perfect that if you fuck something up in chapter one from a storytelling perspective, you won't be able to untangle it for chapter two. Yeah. So I'm like, get the whole thing written out, and then where you have issues here and there, you know, go back and and you can correct that stuff, and you'll be aware of it. Like if if at the end your guy needed to have a submachine gun the whole time, you know, you go back to chapter one and be like, and then he ran out to the submachine gun store, you know, it, like. But oh. if you spend all your time just trying to, no, this has got to be perfect right now before I move on to the next thing, I, I yeah. think you'll you'll stymie yourself doing that. Okay. Yeah, I, it's interesting because, like, um, you know, we, we kind of mentioned uh, my writer's group at the very beginning. And, um, you know, I submit my work to them, like, on a monthly basis. Um, but 
I, I like your approach that you're saying because it's basically like you have to get the story done before you can go back. Because I find that like having people view your stuff before it's completed, you're already making all these corrections and these changes and you come up with like this Frankenstein monster, you know, and it's yeah. not your completed vision. So is this one of these situations where um, like let's say you have five people in the group and then you're each like here's what I did since the last time we met? Right. Okay. Do, do you um, find those to be helpful? You know, I haven't done it probably since college. Um, so I, I don't want to slag. I mean, I, I apologize. I, like I said in the beginning, let me caveat that anything I'm saying is what works for me and you should do what works for you. Um, I haven't really been in that situation since probably college or high school. And I knew I didn't like it then. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't like, Oh, let me keep finding like-minded people to slag my work, slag my work, you know. Uh, so it, it may just be a, a personal thing, but um, yeah, I always remember, I, I like we'd be in those situations, and I'd be like, "Here's a diary or a journal entry that I wrote," and and then they'd like tell me what was wrong with my personal journal entry, and I'd be like, "What value is this to me?" You know, like <laughs> right. I get it. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And that's that's the other thing I kind of get into. And back to uh, Kaylee's question. When you're in one of those groups and you want to be helpful, you can fall into this trap where you're like, I'm going to look for errors. And I mm -hmm. might even be making up errors that aren't mm -hmm. really there. Like that, it's, it's something I came up with and something I found. Right. But like, yeah, like I feel obliged like that. Like, oh, the guy to the left of me helped me. Now I got to help the guy to my right you know right. um when maybe what you needed was yeah this is a pretty solid chapter keep going right so i think with a lot of this stuff it's about unfortunately only through hard-earned experience learning to trust yourself and learning to sort out the valuable critiques from the useless critiques mm -hmm. like i'll bet and i don't want to cast aspersions on your group right. but i'll I'll bet you've got that one guy. I'll bet you got that one guy that that everyone's just like, oh yeah, yeah. Let me just disregard you before you open your mouth. You know, <laughs> you probably also got that one guy that's like real quiet, but when he speaks, you're all like, oh shit, yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's that's my experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's been helpful in some ways, then in other ways it, it hasn't, because I think that like. Ultimately, you kind of touched upon this already that like, you know, writing is so solitary. And I think that uh, a lot of the problems with our modern approach to things is that we have to be so present on social media and so engaged with other people that it feels like writing has to be more social than it is, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, that kind of brings into the next level of questions I wanted to ask you. And that was about um, promoting yourself and getting an agent and essentially how other people become like what you need essentially like you need their help or you need their uh you know reading or whatever to, to read to read your stuff so um the first thing i was going to start this off with was um a quote that I, uh, there was this guy on twitter uh his name was steven uh steve bremner and i'm not familiar with his work or anything like that but i thought this was a, a real interesting quote i want to see what you thought of it uh any publisher worth their salt will only make books out of a fraction of the manuscripts and proposals they receive. Of those, they'll rely heavily on the author to do the legwork of marketing and promoting once they release the book. Rarely are they going to spend large amounts of financial resources on a book if they don't think the author will sell it. So I think what's interesting about that is, I think he's basically saying like, you know, publishing houses will take a chance on you if they believe Stephen Kozanewski will sell this book as a person, as a presence. And I, I think that that is like kind of contradictory to what writing has been for like fucking decades, hundreds of years, you know? So I want to hear what you thought about that. Um, first of all, that quote is solid gold. <laughs> um, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. He's, he's sure, right sure. on. Sure. Um, now it may be as simple as my name is Stephen King or, uh, my name or on the worst end, my name is Kim Kardashian. Um, 
there's just gonna be guaranteed bestsellers mm -hmm. you know uh just because of your name so when you take that they're making they are making a calculus they are making a calculus and i've had manuscripts that i knew were great and would have sold and they take and they make that calculus and they're like is he famous enough is his readership there is the general audience there for this particular story are they all in like Hunger Games fatigue and this is too Hunger Gamesy, or do like do we think this is going to be the next hot thing um, and he's hit the nail on the head and we've got to beat like Penguin or somebody to the gate um, there's this there's this calculus that they do and a lot of it yeah does come down to can you PR Marsh or Gabino Iglesias or Josh Mallerman or whoever are you going to be selling books? Are we going to make our money back? Right. And they, it's like, um, you know, uh, baseball scouting because they, they don't know. There's no way. If, if there was a way they could know, they would just do it. Right. Like there's no way for them to know. But they, yeah, they're doing that calculus and they're trying to figure out um, who's going to be the next big, you know, multi-million dollar seller. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I absolutely think that is true and they're not going to take you if they haven't make, made a very measured you know researched idea that your manuscript is going to sell and this is where we get into that heartbreaking area of where you know uh, art versus business and mm -hmm. you just have to remember that that's the business side but yeah. uh, i'm sorry i forgot was that was the question what was the question especially so so basically uh, my question was like do you believe or do you agree that like they are looking for a person to sell the book and it, i mean it kind of sounds like you do agree that that's what they're looking for like they're looking yeah. for a specific person to sell their book that like you have to have mm -hmm. a presence on like twitter or facebook or youtube or instagram or TikTok. you know yeah i mean yeah. the one thing the one thing i will say in quote unquote their defense uh, yeah. and here we're talking about i guess um the big fat um cigars chomping i know it's they look nothing like that you know top hat wearing uh you yeah. know guys in new york the one thing i will say in their defense is that i think the idea that faulkner or hemingway or whoever were just like chilling back cranking out manuscripts and sending it and never again thinking i think that idea is a romantic one okay. i don't think that was ever necessarily the case now there are there there are some weirdos who's who's the guy um that did uh catcher in the rye oh uh, yeah he he was a weird recluse um and uh the lady, uh, JD Salinger, JD Salinger, and uh, yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird, she was also a weird recluse. So that that does, but I think that's more the exception than anything else. Which, like, if you look back at it, Hemingway was a big gregarious journalist and a personality, and was more famous for hard drinking and going to parties and messing up parties and stuff. It was like the you know the Keith Moon of the you know <laughs> early twentieth century or whatever. Right. Um, so i will say that to be completely fair to those cigar smoking fat cats i think it was always that way okay but it didn't used to be twitter and facebook and uh lotion um commercials and stuff like it, it was it was a different animal back then yeah but um yeah no i i absolutely think that is their expectation that the author is essentially going to be a one person marketing team, uh, whether just purely from being famous or from going viral or, or, or whatever. Yeah. So um, basically the first few questions were about like kind of like the anxieties of being a writer and just get, while you're trying to get your work out. And now these questions are all about like the marketing, like you just said, just sort of okay. getting your name out there. And so uh, this was a question that one of the people from my writing group uh, was asking um she had experience where she was um wanting to submit to publishers but they weren't ex accepting unsolicited submissions 
And then she was also finding that it was hard to find an agent as well. Sure. And so um, do you have any recommendations for getting an agent interested in you? Is it the same thing where you're kind of having to show a presence on social media to get that agent? Like, how does that work? I, oh God, uh, you just like ripped my heart out a little bit. Cause I had this agent um, a couple of years ago and he said to me, I will take your manuscript if you go back and you double your Twitter audience oh. and show me that you've doubled it, yeah. I will take your manuscript. And I was like, fuck you, buddy. I, I, did, I didn't say that. I was just like, oh, thank you for the opportunity, sir. But I immediately went back and I was like, fuck you, buddy. I'm going to double my Twitter audience and I'm never going to fucking talk to you again. <laughs> but um, the... It, I'll, there, uh, now, I, I got an agent in the interests of um, full disclosure. Sure. Uh, I had an agent. We had a very uh, good relationship for about a year, 18 months. Did not work out for the manuscript. Um, and I got these beautiful scintillating, like, I don't know if that's just how they do it in New York and L.A., but they gave me the most glowing letters this is the most beautiful manuscript i've ever read and it rips my heart out to have to tell you no and i was like boy this sure sounds like these guys like the manuscript better than i did as they're rejecting it <laughs> um now the way that i got her uh was through a twitter uh pitch party okay. um are you familiar with that there's like a pit dark, right? Isn't that one of those where you like put out your idea and you put the hashtag pit dark, like something like that? Yes. Yes. There's pit dark. There used to be pit mad. There, there's a bunch of them. Yeah. And um, it feels kind of like a cheat, but it's where I've had the most success with agents. Um, I've probably had more interest from those Twitter pitch parties than all the hundreds of traditional queries that I've ever sent out. Um, so like that might be one thing that that uh your friend wants to look into okay. um, i i really have it's it's i think they probably like it too because it's like um so the way that it traditionally works and we'll, we'll just try and break this down real sure. quick for the audience um the traditional idea is it's like being a door-to-door -door salesman the the traditional way so you go and you knock on a Metaphor metaphorically, you knock on the agent's door and you say, are you interested in buying my product? And then 99 of them slam the door in your face and say no, but you keep going until you find that one who does, who mm -hmm. does want to buy your steak knives or whatever. Um, and, I, and so from their perspective, imagine having 1,000 traveling salesmen knocking on your door every day. It, it must be exhausting. And this is what we call the slush pile, the, the uh, unsolicited manuscripts, um, right. which I think they, they say, like, we try not to call it slush, but that's the industry term. Um, so I think that the agents kind of like, so the way that Twitter pitch parties is go is I just tweet my pitch and I tag it with a couple of hashtags mm -hmm. and then the agents jump in and they look for the hashtags and they go, Oh, well, this pitch looks all right. I don't know Kazanuski per se, but the pitch looks all right. So I think it's kind of like, okay, thank God the door to door, you know, detergent salesmen are not blowing me up all day. I can just kind of at my leisure, pick a couple of things out of essentially the electronic slush. So I think that's why they like it. Mm -hmm. Um, but the only other thing I can say in terms of getting an agent is uh, harden your heart. Be prepared for a lot of heartbreak. I, I'm at the point where if I get a no, I'm happy because usually you just get nothing. You just usually just get no response. Oh, wow. Um, and do all the little things like make sure you're saying, dear Mr. Marsh, and not dear Jim or dear Mrs. Marsh or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, and be polite and as best you can. And like I said, it's like, it is literally like being a door-to-door -door salesman. You're knocking and you're making your cold pitch and you're saying, 
ta-da, here's who I am, here's what I'm selling, da 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 And all you get is like 200 words to do that. So I'm like, be charming, be personable. It's really hard in a letter. But, you know, be charming, be personable, be professional, and keep bashing your head against the wall. And, uh, like, I hear a lot about people that are like, th this is where I can tell that they're kind of posers, is uh, when they're like, oh, I got 12 rejections for this. And I'm like, man... I got 12 rejections for that today. Right. Keep going. <laughs> right. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you did such a great job in your Publish Like a Motherfucker uh, episodes where you were talking about submitting and, and dealing with agents and pitching, you know. And then you, you did do an episode or at least a segment of an episode where you talked about um, self-publishing. And you were kind of mm. comparing self-publishing by going the traditional route. Um, and so I was going to ask you this kind of to tie in with that last question. Do agents prefer uh, to work with people that have not been self-published or are they okay working with people that have been self-published? I, this is one of those things that I think has changed um, because I earned all of this, it, like you were talking about at the beginning of the, of the um, uh, taping here. Uh, some of this stuff has changed since I started querying, you know, 13 years ago, which doesn't sound that long, but with technology and shit, like we're talking about things that didn't exist 13 years ago, you know, like Twitter did, was Twitter even a thing, you know, or Amazon was only what, five, six years old. Um, I think that that has changed mm -hmm. just recently in this past year. Uh, I mean, that's probably not true, but I have, there are some notable people I can point to. So I look at someone like Eric LaRocca. Um, he had, he had such amazing, crazy success self-publishing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that suddenly New York was like, we're stupid to not, you know, throw our lot in with, throw our lot in with this guy. Um, which is kind of like, that used to be that like crazy, like, uh, 50 shades of black, you know, 50 shades of gray dream, you know, like, oh, I'll write something and it'll blow up the world. And then New York will come a call. And um, I think that that actually happens now more regularly than, than it ever did before. Huh. Um, okay. So I don't think you're hurting yourself if you're self-publishing. Mm -hmm. um, and I also don't think it really matters because another thing they'll do is there's this weird sort of corona of excellence or whatever about being a debut author. So I'm pretty sure that if I get picked up by New York at this point, they'll just tell me, drop the stupid Polish name, grab a pen name, and this is going to be your debut, um, which I have definitely seen things show up on debut lists that I'm like, oh, funny. Because that wasn't his fucking debut. He's been yeah. self-publishing for years. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, no, I don't think you're really doing yourself much of a disservice by self-publishing at this point. Um, yeah. I think you're getting your name out there. You're, you know, if, if your thing blows up, there's your ticket right there. If it doesn't blow up and you end up going the traditional route, there's ways around it. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's kind of a no harm, no foul in this situation. Whereas, yeah, I remember, yeah, 10 years ago, they were like, Oh no, hold out. You hold out for your agent. Don't publish a word until you've got an agent. You know? Right. Right. Um, well, let me ask you this, cause you were talking about like, you know, things kind of changing and, and, you know, in the last 10 years, one thing I think that's changed since you put out some of your published like a motherfucker videos is, um, the kind of the rise of like Kindle Vela. Um, are you, do you know anyone personally that uses Kindle Vela at all or, or submits things? Yeah. Yeah. I know yeah. a couple of people. Um, and um, uh, the jury is still out on that, unfortunately for me, um, because I have heard everything, everything ranging from this is the future of publishing to this is crap and don't waste your time. Right. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, for the listeners who don't know what we're talking about, everything old is new again. And K Kindle Vela is basically your old Dickensian uh, 
publishing a chapter of a tale of two cities every week in the magazine and then at some point collecting all the magazine chapters and publishing them uh it's that so you publish you publish you know chapter one or whatever portion of the book at whatever you know statistical uh periodic you know let's say once a week or once a month or whatever that you want to do to keep people interested and keep people buying the next one. Um, so I'll tell you what my concerns about it are, and maybe I'll practice with something and let you know, you know, better next year. Mm -hmm. uh, my one concern is that same thing that Dickens had, which is once it's out there, you can't go back and change it. So some of that stuff I was talking about before where, oh shit, I forgot my main character and needed a submachine gun in the final scene to beat the enemy. I can't go back and change it now. I have to like, oh well, I guess he just doesn't have a submachine gun. Oh. Um, you can't do that because it's out there now. You have to write the chapter and then publish it and then see how it goes. Um, so I was thinking maybe one thing I'll do is take something that's actually completed and polished and just make it look, nobody else has ever seen it. So right. I'll just put it up on Vela and, you know, yeah. essentially see how that goes. I, like, I, I think I'd like to try that. Yeah. So I at least have a work that um, I know is, is working. And you can use that novel that you abandoned that you mentioned before. Oh, which one? Take right? that and chop it up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, jury's out on Vela for now, as far as I can tell. Yeah. D um, and so, just like with self publishing, you don't think that uh, agents have like a stigma about publishing on Vela either, right? No. No. Yeah. I don't. I don't think it's different enough. I think it's because uh, it's the same thing as if you. I mean, at a certain fundamental point. I could also just publish 10 short stories on Amazon, you know, KDP regular. It's yeah. essentially the same thing as doing Vela. Just, I think the thing with Vela is you're, you're trying to develop that, you know, so there's this thing where like, if you're writing a series, like if you're writing wheel of time, like obviously book nine of wheel of time hasn't sold as many as book eight and so on and so forth. And what you're really doing is you're really trying to sell book one every time mm. you release a new book. Mm. and hopefully the tale so it'll it'll always look like this like everybody was willing to give you know fellowship of the ring a shot but then fewer people read the sequel and fewer people still read the sequel to the sequel so you're always trying to get people to go back and buy chapter one mm -hmm. with vela i mean that's yeah. the real goal right yeah. so i could essentially do the same thing i could do vela now and just be like chapter one of this and publish it and do the whole thing but you know yeah so no i don't i don't think it's fundamentally uh, it's just a new like i said it's everything old is new again it's a new whiz bang version of serialized storytelling okay yeah yeah well i i essentially have like two more questions and they're both about social media the reason why i focus a lot on this with the questions is because with your publish like a motherfucker series you kind of got to a certain point where you kind of covered all the bases and i wanted to kind of get it like where it, writers would be if they followed all your videos you know and okay. like because i'm i'm still like in like video two for me right okay. but like I, I think that um you know these questions kind of pertain to like well you're already out there and you've already published and stuff like that like i was going to ask you as far as engagement from readers go um do you actually kind of do you have like a system like a spreadsheet or something like that where you kind of track where you get the most response from viewers like have you ever noticed oh well i tweeted about this book today and more people bought it versus like oh i i put a video up on facebook like is there a way that you kind of compare the social media outlets i know what you're saying and i am quite a stick in the mud and i, I am quite uh like i would be somebody that would do that yeah but uh I don't think I know how that would work for me. Um, Cause what you're really talking about is how does certain marketing translate into sales, right? 
Well, I think I totally like garbled what I was trying to say, but basically it was like, how do you determine like for you personally, it's like, oh, it seems like Twitter is my best tool to use to promote myself. Like, yeah, but you know, how do you determine that? Well, you know? Okay, then then I'll just complete the the thought for you. <laughs> it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. What okay. matters is which of those translates into sales. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I guess I was just a step uh, taking the the logic a step further. Um, yeah, of course, of course, I know where I get my most engagement. Um, yeah. I, cause I can see all my, you know, uh, like, here's what, I, if I do a TikTok video, here's about the response I'm going to get. If I do a Facebook post, here's about the response I'm going to get. If I do a Twitter post, yeah, here's about the response. I'm, of course. Yeah, yeah. I know what my metrics on that look like, but none of that fucking matters. All that matters is which of those translate into actual sales. Yeah. And that's, that's the much trickier part. Um, okay. so yeah. That's what I was getting at. I think I kind of yeah. fucked it up. Like, cause I know that like, okay, yeah, you, you put a video on YouTube and you get like 36 views or something. Right. And then you put a TikTok out and you get like 2000 views. 2000. Yeah. Right. That, that part doesn't necessarily matter because the, the systems themselves are kind of different. Right. You don't get as much traction on YouTube as you do on TikTok. Right. But like, how do you know when the social media is influencing your sale? So you just have to check the sales. Yeah. So the nice thing is, um, well, even if you're not, so, so if, if I'm self publishing something, I can literally just log into KDP and see if I sold something today. Um, and if I'm, if I'm not self publishing, I just have to go to my author central account, um, which, and I've, uh, if you haven't, I, I, I'll double check. I, I'm pretty sure you have an author central account, Pete. Um, but if you people don't get your fucking author central account together, um, because that's where you're going to be able to check more or less your sales for any given day. So what it's going to look like is it's a line graph and, you know, going from one to a million where one is Stephen King and, and a million is that, you know, guy on the corner who managed to, throw something together and get it onto Amazon. Uh, th that's what your sales are going to look like somewhere in between here. Okay. So basically for the normal average person like me, you're going to see a spike when you get a sale, or you might see a crazy spike if you get 10 sales on a day for some reason, like opening day or something. So you can sort of track your stuff that way. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to compare when you're doing a big push of X, Y, and Z on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, compare that to your sales. So either you pull up KDP and you're just like, yep, seven, or you pull up your author central and you're like, yeah, there was a spike or no, there wasn't a spike. So like, it's interesting you bring this up now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because I'm, I am personally way out in cloud cuckoo land right now because <laughs> I did, I did something I've never done before. I, I've never done a, a free, um, a, a freebie run. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I put broken down heroes of the Western night free a couple right. of weeks ago. And then I saw something really weird, which I, I cannot make heads or tails of, mm -hmm. which is that brain eater Jones has suddenly spiked. I'm selling 10, 15, 20 times what I normally sell with brain eater. That's awesome. And the only thing I can identify is I, and, and it's just that one, right? Mm hmm because like i would be like oh okay i had a freebie sale and people were buying across the spectrum and buying all of my stuff mm -hmm. but i think what it was was i had a freebie run and the one also read that amazon was you know recommending mm -hmm. was brain eater mm -hmm. so 300 people bought this and of that 10 percent were like oh let me buy this also bought so suddenly, for no reason, brain eater spike. Yeah. But yeah, like you said, if I wasn't watching my accounts in real time, I never would have caught that. Right. So it's... yeah, yeah, you do. You you have to kind of keep on, especially if you're doing paid advertising, that kind of thing, because a lot of paid advertising is bullshit. But <laughs> if if you do paid advertising, like uh, BookBub, I just had a BookBub for um, Billy and the Clonosaurus. So I can see exactly if that's worth it you know mm -hmm. 
I could be like, I've made my money back or, or not. Mm -hmm. So, so what do you like Stephen Kozanowski see as the, uh, the social media that sells your books the most Twitter, YouTube. Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, I think Facebook. Okay. And this is going to sound strange and kind of like a throwback, but on things like books of horror, mm. um, which is a big Facebook group. Yeah. Um, people will recommend me or when I'm, you know, feeling low, I'll sometimes recommend myself and people will say, I bought it. And then I go back and I check my sales. I'm like, Oh, I did indeed have a sale on hematophages today. Um, so for some reason, I feel like people are actually following through on the buying on Facebook. Yeah. Um, whereas as far as I can tell, TikTok, I get a whole lot of views, but I don't think anybody's doing anything with it. Mm -hmm. And Twitter is more kind of to get in front of people and get. I, so I have this rule. Um, there's a there's probably a magical number. I, I always say seven, but I think you have to see something seven times before you'll consider buying it. Mm. Um, so I'm always trying to get to that seventh time, and you know some people will just never buy it, but you know what are you going to do but uh, with uh, it, it's a whole comprehensive thing because i'm like i need somebody to see me on twitter and facebook and tiktok and all these different places in order to start like burrowing into the back of their subconscious where they're like oh yeah i have heard of that guy yeah yeah so it's kind of a combined thing but if you like back to the wall what is selling the most books it's facebook groups for me yeah i mean honestly that books of horror really does seem to sell books you know like that yeah. really seems to make people want to buy books it, it's funny he said like you have to see it in seven different platforms to make you want to buy it it's kind of like in a uh, batman from 1989 where like the joker puts the chemicals and all the different yeah. beauty products and you have to combine them to <laughs> kill someone yeah um so then we, let's bring up the most toxic of all the social media sites, right? We'll bring up Twitter, which we know, uh, you know, since the last time you did one of your videos, like Twitter has gone off the deep end, right? Yeah. And it could essentially shut down. Um, I know that like for me, that has been my main source for learning about other writers and getting interested in writers and seeing writers sales. Uh, like the horror community, I mean, that's basically been like my whole introduction to the horror community has been Twitter. And like my whole Twitter is just horror people. That is going to be such a huge like loss if Twitter goes away. Do you have any idea of like where it might go next? Like where will the horror community kind of shift to? It's tricky. And I've been thinking about this since that jackass bought Twitter. <laughs> right. But the reason why we have all these social media sites is because they all offer something different. Mm -hmm. And Twitter is that uh, it's essentially like uh, tagging a, um, a billboard in a, in a city street or something, you know, like you throw something up there and you see how people react to it. And I'm like, like the stuff that I throw out there where I'm like in the middle of the night and I'll be like, here's a funny, you know, joke about a cartoon i'm you know, about aqua teen hunger force or something i'm like i wouldn't do that on facebook like it, people would think i was a lunatic they'd be like why is this guy just throwing every thought that comes into his head there and i'm like that's what we're gonna lose when we lose twitter right which i know is kind of the it's the spaghetti against the wall like every thought that comes into your head feel free to throw it out there um you're only going to get canceled sometimes. Um, <laughs> you know, that like, like we're, we're going to lose that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, and I know Keen thinks people are going to go back to message boards. So I know mm -hmm. that's nice, but like I said, it doesn't take that functionality and Facebook doesn't have that functionality. Right. And then we have all these people that are now, I've already seen the death of, what was it mastodon last week everybody was going to go on right right 
and That's now hive. this week it's hive right right and i'm like do you know how many times do you remember Ello and uh <laughs> well not Streamyard, uh the one that was all audio campfire or whatever it was called oh yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah i remember that i didn't use it but yeah i remember that <laughs> the hell was that called oh, i don't even have it on my phone anymore yeah uh oh yeah snapchat that was clubhouse that's what that was called okay um yeah yeah and then snapchat like snapchat's like that but yeah. you're not really tagging a wall yeah. where everybody can see it you're you're saying you can say your clever nonsense but only your friends can see it right um so it's like you're never gonna take off you're never gonna get viral uh but well so i, I will tell you if you want my prediction, it's it's not going to be Mastodon or LO or Hive or anything. nobody's going to like go over there and be like, yeah, and I'm like that's stupid. <laughs> um, I think I hope Twitter doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, I, I hope that they get some kind of sanity and maybe tell Elon to sit in the corner and sit on his hands a little bit. I know it's weird because. You can't do that to a billionaire for some reason in this country. You just have to let him do whatever the fuck he wants. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, we're all in that position. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't. I don't have a good answer. Yeah. I mean, you can fake it. Like there's like you know that wasn't that the point of Truth Social was it was the it's Twitter but with Trump. I'm like <laughs> nobody wants that. And then as far as I can tell that's the problem with Mastodon too is it's like yeah. it's Twitter but you can only see 4000 people instead of all of them. I'm like why would yeah. I want that? <laughs> uh, right, that's, right. that's the worst possible combination of all of these social media tools. Yeah. So I have yeah. no idea. I, I I hope they just fix I hope cooler heads in some way prevail over there. That's all I can really yeah i mean that's it's kind of funny it's like full circle right because um when covid was like when we we're in shelter in place and covid was just like roaring right i remember that um there was a online book festival that you were in and you were in a, a panel with like brian Keane and jonathan jans and i think like maybe two other people and that was the first time i ever saw you oh. and that whole online convention was just so cool to me and i just liked all the people i saw even though i had no idea who the hell like most of the people were and yeah. that was like my introduction to like horror that i love now horror literature uh you know it's just you know through twitter like i wouldn't have known about that if twitter if i hadn't gotten into twitter then too and so uh that will be greatly missed you know because i yeah. th that's that's where i just get like my whole car connection you know i'm just this weirdo sitting on the outside but there's all these people I feel like I know just because of Twitter, you know. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna miss it for what it was. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I must. I'm like, this has happened before. It happened with MySpace and other things. Yeah. You know, displaced it. But I'm I'm like I don't know what's in a position to displace Twitter. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, there's nothing yet. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. So that pretty much like covered all the questions I brought to the table. Was there anything that you have been thinking about that you want to make a video about that? Like I didn't bring up or. Uh, no, this covered a lot of ground. I was not expecting some of that stuff uh, to even talk about. So it, it's really good. I hope it's helpful for you. I hope it's helpful for your um, group. Um, yeah. I really, I really was not trying to slag on the, the group thing it's you you know a good rule of thumb is you get out of something what you put into it right so like if you found a nice non-toxic group and like i said it's probably not the kids that you were neighbors with that you got stuck at at high school so right. you know you're, you're probably somewhat self-selecting you probably like each other that's probably valuable you know i hope it was valuable to them and i hope it was valuable to the greater public but um yeah, well, I'll have to come up with something. Maybe I'll have to just commit to doing this once a month or something. Um, but I, I do want to start doing this more or even, I'll tell you, you know, I should ask you as a podcaster, I, I keep thinking about starting a podcast or something. I just, I don't know what would be valuable that wouldn't just be 
horror authors talking to other horror authors. Like it was something that's been right. done a million times. Right, right. Before I, I do want to start getting out there more consistently. Like, do you, do you have that problem when you're doing the podcasts? Like you just like what what ground am I covering that is novel, or do, is it just like no? I mean, get over that. The, the the most successful podcasts and YouTube channels definitely have like their niche, right? Like where it's like, this is our format or this is what we talk about. Uh, me and my friend, we really just kind of do it just so that we can see each other. I live in Texas and my, my uh, friends, Danny and Brian live in New York. And so it's just kind of a way for us to talk with each other consistently. Um, my, my niche like that I had for my original YouTube channel, Anchor Pete, was that um, I would talk about things that you heard people discussing, but not enough people knew about, right? So I always wanted to like get things in people's ears. I think that like, uh, that's always a valuable thing. If it's like, you know something that, or if, if you're like reading something or watching something, you don't feel like enough people are talking about, then then you talk about it, you know? Right. So yeah, it, it's hard finding your niche and, and, and having something that can, you can make content for every single week or month, you know? Yeah. Right? But like, you know, people just seek it out. Like I, I thought that your channel was just really valuable because like you just explain things very straightforward and you don't get all fucking fancy and you know, like English degree. <laughs> you know what's funny? Uh I saw somebody ask a question. I'm not and I, again I'm not trying to slag on anybody here, but I saw somebody today ask a question and they were like, How much do authors make from their books? And I'm like, all right, let's see what the responses are here. And half the responses were like, well, I'm not going to tell you. Ha, ha, ha. And then the other half were like, I'm making between $2,000 a year and $17,000 a year. And I'm like, it's clearly not what she's asking. And I went in and I'm like, you make like 70% of the sticker price. It's more complicated than that. But that's basically what it is. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I, I would love to cut through this. Sh I'm like, yeah, I can sit here and I can talk about the specifics of, you know, like if you want to go down that rabbit hole, what does a book, how much money do I get from a book? I could talk about that for an hour. There you go. There's the yeah. next published like a motherfucker. But like, yeah, why is nobody just talking about this stuff straightforwardly? I, I don't know. It just, it just feels like there's always been this mystique about writing and that it's like this special thing and that yeah. writers are these like, you know, dramatic personalities where it's just like, in reality, everyone's just a laid back dude with a hard t-shirt, you know? Right. <laughs> I will tell you, um, you probably just made our viewer uh, Kaylee's heart go pitter patter. I know uh, Texas is her favorite place on earth, so. Nice. Have you have you don't sound like you're from Texas? Though. I'm not. I, I'm from New York as well, but I've lived oh, here okay. for 14 years now. Yeah. And then where do you live again? I forgot. I well, I live in Pennsylvania. I am actually on vacation right now in beautiful West Virginia. Nice, man. Um, yeah, we just decided to get the hell out of Dodge. Um, we were literally my girlfriend and I were sitting there last week. We're like, what do you want to do for Thanksgiving? Like, I don't know. What do you want to do for Thanksgiving? And we're like, oh, let's just fucking tell the family to go to hell and just get out of town oh, that sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but i was like the only th the only thing that i can't do is uh um screw up my my supposed interview with pete really pete's interview with me <laughs> oh, oh here we go yeah, i knew wrote, she would say something yeah i'm coming to get you texas when i can escape the uk for a bit oh, okay so she's in the uk all right i didn't know that yep um are you coming to Texas anytime soon, Stephen, or no? Uh, uh, well, maybe for KillerCon. Um, oh, yeah. I, d I don't like flying. Well, I, I, I'm going to have to fly next year, so maybe I'll report back on that. But I haven't flown since the pandemic, and I'm kind of scared to get in a flying death tube, even though I've gotten all my shots. I got my last shot. Yeah. God, what was it, two weeks ago or something? So I feel like I'm pretty um, good to go, but I'm just scared to get in a flying death tubes, and I'm not fucking doing the drive. I drove to Oklahoma when, when I first joined the Army, and I'm not doing that again. <laughs> that was 24, out, 24 hours on the road. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, from New York from, to Texas yeah. is 27 hours. It's so yeah. rough. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I went to uh, the Ghoulish Book Festival. Max. Oh yeah. Booth, yeah, movie. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was so freaking great. So like intimate and stuff. It was just awesome. It was in San Antonio. I'm probably gonna hit that up again. I don't. I don't really travel that much. So like that's that's only two hours away from me. So that's easy. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Is it the Alamo? Yeah, right, exactly. It's right near there. Yeah. Joke yeah. for you, uh, Texan viewers out there. Oh, <laughs> here I am, like, yeah, yeah. It's just yeah, yeah, I don't... yeah, yeah. I, I love that. <laughs> do, you ever, do, you ever, do you ever see that Pee Wee? Of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Where, yeah. where they're like, what do you remember? And seeing that as a kid, I'm like, I don't get it. And you right. go back and you watch it now, and there's all the cowboys, and he's like, I remember the Alamo. They're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that's good. No, Max is a real, real sweet guy. Um, I actually have, to, I just read, uh, it was, the, it reminded me of being in Oklahoma. Uh, what was it called? We Have to Do Something. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The tree fell. Right, uh, right, right. They made a movie of it, yeah. Yeah, they, they just made a movie of it. Yeah. Because uh, that happened to me in Oklahoma. It was two days, I think, before I was supposed to leave for Iraq. Oh, and shit. a tornado touched down a block away from my house and apparently it just like went in like a path and destroyed a bunch of shit like over on that block yeah. and so me and my wife at the time went and went and hid in the um bathroom and i remember my good friend in the army who was living with us at the time was like no if, uh, it's, if it's my time to go i'm just gonna die and we're like don't sit out there and die come into the powder room with us so there was like three of us in the powder room uh and 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 then Max wrote that fucking book, and I was like, "Oh my god, I've been through that!" <laughs> Holy shit! Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a good movie too. We we interviewed Max on the Lasser cast. That was actually oh, okay. our first. He was our first horror author that we interviewed, and uh, yeah, he he has a podcast himself where he talks to horror authors, and um, he he released the novella. We need to do something. He released it like on his channel. We could just listen to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that, that's a crazy fucking story. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't thought about that in a while. Yeah. So, um, you know, if, if we were on my show, my thing, that we, I, would, I would ask, like, you know, what, what can you plug right now? So I know you just did your sale. Uh, I actually got your book when it was free, too. So um, that's your most recent thing that you've published, right? Uh, no. Clickers Never Die is the most recent thing that I've published. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So Clickers Never Die is out there and available. Mm -hmm. Um. Broken Down Heroes of the Western Night is free through November 30th. And Billy and the Clonosaurus is 99 cents through, I think also through the 30th. I just got a book bub for that. Oh, nice. So you can get me very cheap right now um, <laughs> is the short answer yeah. on that. But yeah, uh, so let me take the reins back or whatever. So where can folk, folks find you? And oh, yeah, uh, what are you plugging right now? Uh, <laughs> well, like I said, I got two books that are coming out in uh, 2023, but I don't have set dates for them. Um, one of them is called There's No Way This Is Right. And the other one is The Fields Burn uh, Red. And so uh, I'm working on them at the time being. They're going to be self-published. Um, besides that, I have my channel, The Lasser Cast, which you can find on YouTube. You just type in The Lasser Cast. Uh, it's also on Spotify and all other podcast channels. The other channel is called Comic Books Transformed, and uh, you can find that on YouTube and on um, you know any kind of podcast channel. I'm on Twitter as uh, Anchor P29 is my handle. Um, I have a website PRMarsh.com, and uh, you can find my author page on Facebook too. P uh, good. No, author PR Marsh. Yeah. Good. good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I. Uh, I I mean, if it, if I was bullshitting you, I just wouldn't bring it up if I thought you had garbage covers. But I looked at those covers, and they're really nice. Did you, yeah, did yeah, you do those yeah. yourself? Or, uh... No, no, no. Um, that is um, A.A. Medina, right? He's a, a guy on Twitter, and he um, does art. His, his art is called uh, Fabled Beast Productions, I believe is the name of it. And um, like he, he always has stuff on Twitter where he's like, oh, this you can just take this template and you can make it into a cover. And I just essentially found the ones that kind of matched my stories I was trying to tell. And I just thought the artwork was great and kind of inspiring. So, yeah, I, I love those two covers. They're, they're, they are the inspiration for me to, to write these stories. Yeah, I'm really – I think the, the Fields Burn Red looks really awesome. 
Yeah. And uh, I mean, the other one's nice too, but but that one particularly caught my eye. So. Well, you know, and that actually kind of brings up a question I didn't ask you during the interview phase, but like, um, you know, how do you feel about covers? Like, do you feel like, because I see on Twitter now, there are a lot of people that have pre-made covers and then there are people, you know, like, have you gone to an artist every single time to make your cover? Uh, The only exception to that, yes, I, I like artists and I like art like painted work rather than what do they call it photo bash yeah. um so there's and you can tell this is funny aside um my good friend mary fan um she has a, a cover for her book um artificial absolutes and her character's name is jane colt and the it was a photo bashed cover so somebody took some stock images and, and it's a nice nice enough cover yeah. but um now us and her other friends, every time that we spot that model on another cover, right. we'll send it to her and we'll be like, spotted Jane in the wild. Right. Um, so like, I mean, it's whatever. You can you can get a perfectly decent photo bash cover, um, but I prefer the originals um, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll pay a little extra for that. Um, but I, ha- yes, I've gone to an artist or my publisher has every single time. The only exception to that was, um, my very limited release horseman, which I only put out 50 copies of that. And it was just, it was just one of these experimental things. And I will not do that again because although I only paid $75 for the pre-made, I probably spent 24 hours going through pre-made sites, trying to find the perfect thing. Jesus. Okay. And it's it's not good. It's not f- good for my brain. I, I told you the thing before about how like I will literally I will query hundreds of agents for things. Yeah. I, I will keep going on one of those sites and I'll be like, this is pretty perfect, but it's not as perfect as humanly possible. Right. Um, so I did I spent hours and I finally found something and I was like, there is nothing else on the internet that is better than this. <laughs> Right, but I'd almost rather, for my peace of mind, pay an artist rather than do that again. Yeah, but if if you're the kind of person um, that y- you can make decisions without obsessing over them, uh, that might be the way to go. Be aware that, like I said before about Mary's cover, um, it can just look like a bunch of other covers. There's only so many models that you know they'll Google like Android Lady. Right, right, right. And you'll right. you'll get that Android lady from Shutterstock if if you wrote something about robots. Right. That's the stock footage you're getting. Right. Um but yeah, just in generally speaking, you you need to have a beautiful cover. Right. And I was talking about this event we just did this weekend in, in Mechanicsburg. Mm-hmm. Um you can tell it's it was a mate we they told us what was different about this event was they told us the authors are not going to stand there hawking. The authors are going to stand in the back of the bar mm-hmm. and will only sign when approached. Okay. And it was funny watching that because there's nobody standing there hawking the books. Right. So it was purely just people going, pretty cover. <laughs> right. And that's the first step. That's the first step to anyone ever reading you is your cover. Right, right. I, yeah. I always say this, but like the expression never judge a book by its cover applies to everything besides books. books. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just like uh everything is about sex except uh sex, sex is about power. Right. <laughs> Sounds like something James Spader would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, like I said, like those those two covers kind of keep me motivated with these two stories and I'm trying to get them out in twenty twenty three, but you know, we'll we'll Good see. Luck. I I, I have gleaned a lot from your, you know, videos, man. And I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me long ago. That really helped me out a lot. Yeah. Anytime, man. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, don't want to keep you too much longer. Uh, so thanks for tuning in and we'll just end it here and catch you on the flip side. Awesome. Thanks.